I call this meeting to order. Will everyone please stand? Okay, Council. I'm going to start off with roll call. So I'm having a little technical difficulties. Um, so if we could um, please um, announce that you're present in your name. Uh, uh, Councilor V. Hill, present. Councilor Jackie V. Hill, present. Mayor Ty Coleman, present. Councilor Liz Hensley, present. Councilor Jamie Dominguez, present. Councilor Don Krebs, present. And Mayor, for the record, I want to show that Michael Carson is not here tonight. Okay. Uh, Councilor Carson. Mayor Coleman. Did, mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Carson should be jumping on Zoom. He did message earlier saying he would be on Zoom for the regular meeting. He's not on currently, so he may be late. And for the record, in case he does not show up, it would be an excused absence. It is for work. Yeah, so work to, to note that for the record. Okay. Thank you. So I'm having a, some difficulties with my technology, so I'll just go back to old school paper. All right. So uh, up next, we have the agenda approval. Mayor, I move that we approve the agenda as presented, maybe excusing Mr. Carson if he can't make it tonight. Okay. I approve. I mean, I second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. If not, please start voting. The motion carried unanimously. Hey, okay. thank you, Ms. Ariel. That brings us to the next item on the agenda. Citizen comment. That is the, uh, this is the portion of the agenda to where those of you who have turned in your comment cards, uh, we uh, will call your name. You would come up to the podium and you can make your comments. We do ask that you keep your comments to within uh, three minutes. You will be time. If you're still talking at the three minute mark, I would politely ask you to uh, stop making uh, your comments at this time. Um, and usually it was brought to my attention too, whenever we have elected officials, um, in, in the room, we like to recognize current and past elected officials. And I think I see Councilman Brawls, who used to be a city council member here with city council. And we have our school board, Ms. Heidi, she spits in back there, a president as well that I see. And um, if I miss anybody, I apologize. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but I'm, I'm not wearing my glasses. Who is that back there that I may be missing? Anybody? Okay, thank you all. Thank you, school board. Appreciate you being here, everyone. And Mayor Coleman, mm -hmm. before we start calling people, I do want to um, point out, I think most of the individual cards you have are related to first readings or, or items that don't have a public hearing. But we do have a public hearing um, for, the, for the budget, for the pay plan, and a public hearing for the moratorium on medical and retail marijuana. So if anyone is here for those, the most appropriate time would be to wait for the public hearing. So, but if it's any of the other issues or any issue not on the agenda, now is the appropriate time. Okay, that sounds good. So if you're talking about any of the items that are on the agenda regarding, that's gonna be a part of the public hearing, you'll have a time to make the comments. So if I call your name and you just wanna wait until that time, you're more than welcome to do that, okay? Um, the first one is Annie. Hello, I believe there's a process. So I state my name. You just name. say your name and start talking. Awesome. Hi, I'm Annie Altwarg. I am a member on the Alamosa Bicycle Working Group. We are here to present a month or two ago. 
I wanted to formally invite you and all of you to the third bike walking and rolling audit that we're doing here in Alamosa. It is on November 12th from 2 to 4 p.m. It departs from the State Avenue River Trail access, so 6901 North River Road, right across the bridge. And it'll be a great opportunity to come together as a community to see how our infrastructure is fitting the needs of our community members. This route will be really awesome because it's a good mix of both city property and county property. So I will also be presenting to the county commissioners as well. Following this audit, I will also probably be reaching out to you, each of you individually, to see if you're interested in partaking in a bike roll or walking outing with the Alamosa Bicycle Working Group around specifically your wards or in areas that you have in mind. I promise you when we're out exploring together, it's much more meaningful and we can understand a lot more than just me standing up here and, you know, telling you what I think, but actually understanding people's experiences while they're out. Now you might be wondering what an audit is. And so I brought my paperwork. Um, Heather, what's the rule? Can I distribute? Cool. So here's the flyers. I brought that up for everyone. And then I have these, let's do this. I have these maps of what audits are. So there's these worksheets developed by AARP and the League of American Bicyclists. So if you've never done an audit before, it might help you understand, you know, what am I looking at here? You know, how can I understand this better in my own environment as well? And so, you know, it consists of, you know, whether it's snowing or raining out, how does that affect the road conditions? You know, if there's, let's see, you can draw a map as well and just understand a street by street analysis. But I think that's, yeah, you can hand out everything there. And they're also in English and Spanish. So if you have Spanish. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Up next, we have Christina Bolt. Hello, I'm Christina Bolt. Um, I work with La Puente Street Outreach. So I um, spend a good amount of time out at St. Benedict's and I'm just, just um, wanted to bring up something that I feel fairly passionate about regarding the rules um, that will be read um, and considered to be changed out at St. Benedict's. I believe one of the rules that you'll be presented with is that there be a six month limit for people staying out at St. Benedict's. And um, I just wanted to try to give some, what that might look like. So a lot of our folks who are out at St. Benedict's are um, out there because they have no other place to go. And they are here because either family or friends or they were born here is, is the majority of folks. And so for a typical person out there to get housed, um, they would need to get all of their IDs, which typically can take at least, well, it really depends on the state that they were born in. If it's here, great, I can get people IDs pretty quickly. Um, but if they happen to be born in Texas, which is the other um, leading place, it can take quite a while. I've had one resident of St. Benedict's, it was six months to get his uh, birth certificate from Texas. And then, um, so we can get them into like a housing list with behavioral health where they can be selected for voucher assistance if they are unable to work for any reason. Um, usually it's because of disability and um, that being selected can take several months because it's not just a top down list. I believe there's about a hundred and some people on that list, but if they are selected, they get a voucher um, and then they have to find housing um, in the area that will accept them. And that can take quite a while because most of our folks are out there because they have some evictions or some poor rental history. So it takes a lot of footwork on their end and um, our case managers and to be able to find housing that will work with them and whatever issues um, they may have. If they have a pet, that then means they need to get um, like um, certification that the pet needs to be with them, which means they need to go to the doctor. And we all, I think we all are kind of familiar with how long roughly getting into the doctor can take here. And then um, 
yeah, putting with a PCP and getting all that paperwork done. So I just wanted to kind of give like a little bit of background of how impactful that six month limit could be for my folks out there. We're working really hard, um, but every time somebody, you know, um, either leaves the area for a little bit to live with a family member, we kind of have to start back at square one. And um, so it a lot of times takes much more, much longer than six months for, for our folks. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have uh, Lori Smith. I'm going to pretend I'm tall today. <laughs> uh, my name is Lori Smith. I stand before you today, not just as a principal, but as an advocate for the future of our city. Because our students have, because our students want a future and they deserve a future. We all understand that education is not one size fits all. Many of our students who come to us are facing significant barriers, whether social, emotional, or academic. Some have struggles in traditional settings, while others need more personalized and flexible environments. Our school, Alamosa Online, Alamosa Alternative, with the Alamosa School District, exists to provide a safe place where students can be themselves and receive targeted support as they need to thrive. But while we are rich in heart and commitment, our current facility limits us in the ways that we directly affect students' outcomes. Our building as it stands simply does not meet the needs that we need for space that our students deserve. Our classrooms are too small to allow individual attention to our students in which they deserve. Our common areas are cramped, making it difficult to foster community atmosphere, and it is vital for their social and emotional well-being. The demand for an alternative and online education is growing as more and more students are facing unique challenges that require a different approach. We are doing our best to support them, but without a new facility, one that is designed with the specific needs of these students in mind, our ability to serve them is hindered. A new building with larger classrooms, counseling space, an area of skill building programs, AKA maybe a possible storefront, selling moose gear, it would give the flexibility to create this type of learning environment that our students need. We know that when students feel safe, supported and valued, they are more likely to stay engaged in school and on track to graduate. They are more likely to build the skills and confidence needed to contribute to our community in other meaningful ways. I know I'm asking for your support in the building, this new facility that we can meet the needs of our students, these, of these exceptional students. This investment will not only provide improvement in their lives of the students we serve, but also in the benefit of the whole entire community. These students are our future, our workforce, our future leaders, and they deserve every opportunity to succeed. Thank you for your time and consideration. Together, we create a space where every student has room to grow, that they will support, be supported and thrive in a chance to build a bright future. Thank you. Thank you. The next one we have is Selena. Hello, okay. Hello, my name is Selena. Again, I would like for you to consider voting for us to get a new building. The school is a place where we learn, but also feel welcome for be beginning. Like the beginning, since I've been there, like, I'm be honest, I felt welcomed, you know. I go to school, teachers, you know, I, I was cool with them, but like they, you know, they wanted you to do your work and, you know, there's a lot of things going on, but like, I didn't feel connected, you know, as a student, as they have to focus on every other student to understand, but they just, you know, come to school and you want to you wanna talk to your teachers. You want to get to know what's the next agenda on the school board. You don't just want to go to school. Oh, my teacher, you know, some students don't feel like that. Not all do, but I feel welcomed at school as well. But the staff care about not just as what we learn, 
but what we care about mostly. We are people, you know. I believe that coming to school has led me and other students to the best versions of ourselves. The staff not only celebrates our accomplishments, but also helps us fix our mistakes in school and in life. The school has given me an opportunity to want to finish school, to look at a life in a new perspective. I feel hopeful for my future and that I will succeed. The new building will be a safe place for students to find the new perspective and see that they can succeed as well. I'm not trying to get your vote, I'm trying and asking for you to also help us understand that we are people in the community who care for us and as much as the staff cares for us. And thank you for trying to understand me. Thank you. Have a nice night. You too. Judy McNeil Smith. Good evening, Council. My name is Judy McNeil Smith, and I'm a resident of Alamosa County. Uh, I want to speak on the rules with St. Benedict. I am on the Homeless Coalition, so I have had the opportunity to work um, with that committee. And it's all committees. You don't always get everything that you want. Um, but as Christina articulated, I just want to make sure that um, the, the one rule that I have some issues with is the, is the timing on that. And just to ask that the six-month time period uh, Christina talked about how difficult it is for some folks to get those um, housing options. There are some folks out there that I'm not sure will ever get the housing options. I know at least um, a couple of people out there, I've been around a long time, I've known them in different systems for a long time. So I'm just asking that folks have um, compassion around the timing and the trauma that people are experiencing there. And while we have rules in place that we can um, really keep that in mind when we're implementing them. So, um, and I also support a new building for the school district. So <laughs> while I'm up here under my th <laughs> thank, thank you. Courtney V. Hill. Okay. Um, I'm Courtney V. Hill. I am the academic coordinator at the Alamosa Alternative School. Um, I'm gonna try not to get emotional, okay. Um, I stand here before you to advocate for a group of young people who've been failed by the adults in their lives and by the systems that were supposed to support them. These are the students of the Alamosa Alternative School. These students are not just statistics or problems to be solved. They are children in our future. And they are asking for a chance to succeed, just like every young person in the city. For many of these students, the Alamosa Alternative School represents more than just a place to learn. It's a safe haven, second chance, and for some, a last hope to break generational cycles um, that have held them back for too long. These students have faced adversity that most of us can only imagine. Unstable home lives, poverty, trauma and neglect. But despite those challenges, they come to school to learn every day, determined to rewrite their stories. The Alamosa School, the alternative school, provides these students with individualized attention, support, and opportunities they need to succeed. It offers them a community where they are seen, heard, and valued. It gives them the tools to build a better future, not just for themselves, but for their families in the city of Alamosa. However, the school cannot do it alone. It needs your support and our belief in these young people. It is easy to invest in projects that offer immediate returns or that cater to those who, have already, who already have a voice in a platform. But the true measure of our community is how we treat those who need us the most. If the city is going to invest in something, let it be the future of our youth who need it the most. Let us invest in breaking the um, cycles of poverty, neglect, and failure. Let us invest in a place that gives every student, no matter their background or their past, a fair shot. The Alamosa Alternative School is not just a school, it's a lifeline. And I urge you to recognize its value and the incredible potential it holds. Let us come together as a community to ensure that every young person in Alamosa has the opportunity to achieve their dreams. Because when we invest in our youth, we invest in a brighter future for us all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Up next, we have Ruthie Brown. Okay. 
Good evening, Ruthie Brown, 711 State Avenue. I have a, a couple of questions on the um, uh, homeless camp rules uh, and maybe some suggestions. So uh, one on forms, I'm wondering if it's ever necessary to do a background check. Um, I don't know how much that entails or just a thought. Um, and then I look at camp cleanliness and I look at participation will be tracked. And if a camper fails to participate within a three month time frame, they will be trespassed. Well, three months seems like a long time, you know, we're going to stay here three months and we're out of here, you know, so I, it's kind of like when, when my grandkids misbehave, I don't, I don't give them three months to get better. And then I, when we, when we discuss the rules, I, I'd, I'd really like to know what happens with trespass and trespassed. I know when we have, um, Oh, folks at, at Walgreens or in front of the dollar store or something, they're trespassed. What does that mean? Is there a fine? Does it tie up officer's time? Does it tie up uh, court time and that sort of thing? Um, then, uh, and that's the same with city property, an immediate trespass. I look at criminal activity and it says suspicion of criminal activities, including the use and or distribution of illegal drugs could lead to immediate trespass. If I'm not wrong in the huts at the, oh, at the huts that were out there, I believe they were also cooking meth. I don't, I don't know if that's something else that needs to be prohibited that, uh, uh, you can't do that. Um, and then um, bullying behavior. You know, if someone's getting bullied, who do they report it to? Who who sees it? Um, how do we know? I mean, I suggested at a meeting a couple months ago or whenever that there be someone on presence on site 24-7. So all of this could be monitored. But... Um, and I look at continued refusal to actively engage with service providers could result in trespass. Well, how, how long can they continually refuse? And, um, and then the six month thing, as I understood it, they have a chance to get another six months. And I also, in extreme cases, maybe it should be a case by case situation. And if it needs to go longer, um, Thank it you. should. Thank you. Um, next, Danny. Hi everyone, I'm Danny Robin. Um, I'd like to express my strong support for the adoption and implementation of a dark sky lighting ordinance for our community. Through my work with San Luis Valley Great Outdoors, I have had the pleasure of speaking with hundreds of community members that have expressed deep appreciation for the Valley's dark skies and have also heard a lot of concern and frustration when people experience light trespass and excessive glare in their community. Preserving our dark skies is not just a feel good endeavor, but an effort to improve community well being, health, and safety. So, why do we need this ordinance? Well, we would actually experience more light on the ground where it's needed and improve safety and security by mitigating deep shadows created by glare. We would also reduce our energy consumption, which would lead to cost savings, benefiting our residents, businesses, and communities' budget. And we'd be able to get ahead of future development and drive sustainable economic growth through thoughtful lighting practices. We would beautify the city with aesthetically pleasing dark sky lighting and be able to recognize the community's commitment and stewardship of dark skies, providing a competitive edge to destination development and sustainable tourism. We'd also protect our natural environment and the nocturnal wildlife that is reliant upon natural darkness for biological processes. 
So by prior prioritizing the implementation of this ordinance, we can enhance the city's infrastructure so that it prioritizes safety and visibility, and we can foster appreciation for our natural surroundings, promote diverse and inclusive outdoor recreation opportunities like stargazing and improve overall quality of life. Let's work together to ensure our community shines bright without overwhelming the night sky. Thank you. Thank you. Caroline. Hi, my name is Caroline Burkhart um, and I'm a resident of Alamosa. Sorry that you're having to hear from me twice tonight. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to talk about the uh, motion for St. Benedict's. Um, I would like to um, just kind of reiterate some of the potential logistical problems with that one subset of it, which is the six month uh, time frame. Um, and as the director of street outreach uh, mentioned, just if that uh, seemingly arbitrary timeline is actually um, a viable one, um, not just for folks out there this summer, that this is nothing in comparison to what our folks out in the encampment are facing. Um, but uh, this summer I had to look for new housing. I have a great housing record. Um, I have a full-time job. It took me about four months to find housing within my budget in Alamosa because I wanted to stay within uh, the county limits. Um, I have a pet, so maybe that's what caused my problems. Um, but just knowing that, um, you know, residents of the encampment uh, usually have a little bit more groundwork to put into finding housing. Um, I, I understand that the six months is probably so that it doesn't become people's like full stop, right? And, um, and I would, from what I understand from the director of street outreach, uh, it's not their intention that that would be people's find it, final landing spot, you know, in a long-term basis but it is supposed to be a temporary one so they can get their feet on the ground and move forward. Um, so I would like you to reconsider that, that six month uh, time frame. Um, the second is thing that I wanted to bring up is more of like a personal request. Um, I, and um, I work in a communications office. So the website that I work on is not always updated and things like that. So I, I can't point fingers without saying I, I also, also fall short in this area, but um, I think it would be helpful for as a resident of Alamosa to have a little bit more clarity about how to find like minutes from city council meetings. Sometimes I struggle to navigate the website. Um, moreover, as I have attended city council meetings, I sometimes hear you all reference comments that you've received uh, through the online platform or the email. And I'm not sure if I'm entitled as a resident to be able to view some of those comments to have more context and understanding the decisions that you reach. Um, so if I'm not, I think it would be helpful to have that kind of outlined on the website about what a, a citizen of Al Alamosa, um, what information they are able to access and what is kind of more private. So that's just a personal comment. Thank you. Thank you. Kimberly Rodriguez. Good evening, my name is Kimberly. In my opinion, I think we should get this new school for, for various reasons. Other kids should have the opportunity to experience, express themselves how, with how they feel and with that, with what they need, with no judgment, and you can find the right, find that right at my school. Our school provides the right materials for students that need a little extra help that they can't get at other schools. Other schools that need this help deserves the opportunity, opportunity to join our family. I feel, I feel it is wrong for those students to, to get denied to join our school because it is too small. We don't have the space for them he, here. When I came to the school, I was a year behind and it, and it is a dream come true to graduate this year with my CNA license and have a good have good grades. We 
We are not bad students. We are just students that need a little push who have big dreams in this world. And our teachers are not just teachers. They are, they are our motivators and the people that push us to do our best no matter what. This school downtown is not just a school. It is a place like home to people who care about us and show us love. Thank you. Thank you. Adrian. Good evening, council members. Uh, my name is Adrian Ramirez. I'm the director of maintenance for the Alamosa School District. Uh, currently four months on the job um, and it's a task. I'm here on behalf of these 700 main building um, and my current employer was Valleywide, and with them, I had the uh, I was able to remodel 1101 Main for all you that lived here in the past. That was the old 711 building. That was me that did that project. I ran that project, and before I left Valleywide, I was also tasked with starting the process of remodeling the courthouse. Not sure if any of you guys have ever seen the courthouse, the interior, if you walked it prior. The floors are coming apart. Plumbing, it was flooded. Plumbing's bad. The ceiling's awful. Uh, it was deteriorating from the rain, just from, from everything. Pigeons are a nuisance. Um, we really cleaned the, the roof over there. I'm advocating because no one likes to see what time does to a building if it's never vacated. Um, I'm gonna be in charge of the task of hopefully maintaining and keeping the building. Um, I asked that the councilman highly think of, of approving the, the purchase of this building for us and moving in. Um, of course, everybody knows our students are great for the school district. We're doing great things for them moving forward, but no one likes to see a vacated building, especially downtown, um, especially the work that has to get into it. Um, you know, uh, just the remodel, the rebuilding process, um, it's, 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 it's a task in hand. Um, so with that, uh, like I said, um, homelessness, was a huge issue at the courthouse. Um, we had a lot of people sleep there, break in, break windows, um, make rooms inside the building. So, and it's only a matter of time before 700 Main gets the power turned off, electricity turned off. And of course, you all know with the cold here, pipes will freeze. Um, hence the damage in front of the concrete where the courthouse was, we, we insulated that pipe put antifreeze and the pressure busted that pipe. And of course there's no concrete now there. So I'm hoping you guys can avoid that with this building. Let us move in, let us take care of it. Let us maintain it. Let us put it to a good use, especially for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda. Oh, two Amandas, this Amanda. Oh, sorry. Amanda Pearson, uh, yeah. <laughs> resident of City of Alamosa. I just don't get to, I've been wanting to say this. I love downtown. I love downtown. I understand, I got to watch last at the last meeting, them giving you guys a, a update on what that committee, what that advisory board is doing. And it made me think about how much work it went into. I know that what he said, we got like 30 people who, who contributed to how we were going to do it, which is a lot for a city council and not a lot for a city to make decisions on, right? We wish we could get so many more people involved. I know that traffic was uh, scary and horrendous before, but that one of the trap, if you get experts involved, narrowing the roads slows the traffic down. I think if you ask the, the chief, I'm not seeing a lot of accidents on downtown. It seems scary that's why people slow down, right? There's there's experts who came. There's experts who are talking about businesses. I don't mind a school being there if it meets the, the goals of what you have downtown. Can we not have vacant buildings? Can we have people coming to downtown and shopping and doing those things? I always fed my kids when I picked them up at school. Maybe you got more customers down there. Um, that was one of the things I felt bad about when social services moved out of downtown area was that you lost all those lunch customers in the winter time. It's really important. I love downtown. I love giving the businesses a chance to look good. But what you guys did is you got the experts from all the different areas, 
law enforcement, traffic. You got the experts. And I just want the same thing as I said to the mayor after the first um, uh, meeting this after evening was, I want, if we're going to pass laws, if we're going to make plans, let's make sure we understand what our goals are. And let's make sure we have the right information to make sure we are going to reach our goals. So identify the goals clearly. The goals, getting that building down, the school building cleaned up and sold may be a priority. When you're working with the homeless, when you're working with the people that La Puente deals with, I just want the same consideration. I don't want there not to be experts in the area, information from every other areas about what works and what doesn't work to happen before we decide, before you all just make the decisions. I wanna help you be informed, get experts, ask the right questions. Don't, um, don't let yourself be blind in those kind of important decisions when they're dealing with the people that I'm working with. That was my my only thing today. Thank you so much for the hard work you guys put in. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Brianna. Hi, my name is Brianna Martinez. I stand before you not just as a student, but a member of our community who has witnessed firsthand the transformation power of education in my school. I have participated in all of these meetings so far. I'm inspired by the hope and faith, faith that exists among our students and in our community. I'm dedicated to see my vision for our school come true. I successfully wrote a grant that secured $11,000 for our school to establish a washer, dryer, shower, and hygiene station for students in need. Unfortunately, given our current facil facilities, it is challenging to meet all these essential needs. It is vital to remember that every student deserves an opportunity for success, regardless of their circumstances. We all face challenges and make mistakes in life. We are not all fundamentally different from other students. We do, not, we, are, we do not pose a danger to our community. We are students, not a threat to anybody. And we would do anything to prove those who think down and bad about us different. We are human and we all deserve a chance to thrive. On a personal note, I came from a really low time in life to now thriving tremendously just by coming to this school alone. I now look at my life in a new way. I finally found myself while being at this school. All I ever wanted to do is see people do good in life and be happy and healthy. And it will absolutely break my heart to see these students getting denied to join our school slash family, just for the fact that our school is not big enough to function very many students. We all have bright futures and as a community, and as a community, we need to help each other out in any ways possible, especially when it comes down to young students getting the education that they need. The feeling that you get when you finally get to your senior year is the basic feeling, especially when you brought yourself back up and fought for the spot to be successful and feel like you actually matter and like you did it on your own. Some students have no one to be there for them ever, but at my, at my school, our students have each other's backs and the teachers are constantly there. It doesn't matter where you come from or what you have done in the past, there's no judgment. This school has a huge impact on students and families. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron Miltenberger. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Council. I, I first just want to say what a vibrant community, uh, a, a community who's doing the right things, has people show up and debate and bring their opinions before so that we can make good decisions. There are a lot of topics out here tonight that are important to our community from dark skies, which I think is amazing, um, to bicycle coalitions, to homeless camps, to ordinances about schools. Um, you're doing big work. And I think it shows when the community comes up and gets involved. So my appreciation to you for making a space where you're doing good work and to the community for showing up and being a part of that process. I have given myself the unenviable position of trying to represent diverse views on the Main Street Advisory Committee. Um, so not all of these are my views necessarily, but I feel like it's important for council. And I don't wanna to take too much of your time because I know that there's a lot of other folks and, and we've chatted briefly about it. Um, 
the Main Street group is, is reasonably divided about the purchase of the Fridays building. And I think primarily uh, there are two issues that um, have been most contentious. And the first is uh, retail on the first floor. And, and I think that's pretty cut and dry. Um, they have grandfathered use. They don't have to necessarily have retail. And I think the school district has done a good job of trying to think about possibilities to make accommodations and compromise for something on the first floor that would support retail. I think everybody on the Main Street group believes that we should have a vibrant downtown and that the vibrant downtown should be, be welcoming and representative of everybody in our community from young people um, to teachers and administrators and people who work in offices. Um, and I think that's consistent with your plan. Um, I, I also know that those folks on the Main Street group are really interested in the rules that we've been following. We have a great downtown plan. It's got us to this point now where we've been recognized by the governor of the state of Colorado for having an excellent downtown plan. We've been following that plan because we think it really meets that goal. Um, and there's some frustration when we ask for variance on a plan that was put in place by experts to achieve a certain thing. Um, I think the unintended consequence of an educational facility is really the biggest bone of contention. And it really runs up against some of those intended uses um, and specifically the, the alcohol piece. And as somebody who has a sister who is a uh, alcoholic and in recovery, as family members who are alcoholics and in recovery and works with young people who have substance use disorder, this is a near topic to my heart. Um, and I don't envy you that choice. You have to balance businesses with protecting the safety of young people. Um, and I think that's really challenging. Ultimately, I think the best interests of our community will come forward. I urge you to pass on first reading uh, this over to public comment. I also want to invite you all to the gala with the Boys and Girls Club on Saturday at five o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Amanda Hensley. Hello, my name is Amanda Hensley and I am a lifelong Alamosa native, an Alamosa High School graduate, and the current Chief Operations and Financial Officer for the Alamosa School District. My family also owns and operates a business in Alamosa, and so we make supporting our city and community a big priority because we want to support and help the people that support us and to contribute to our local economy. This is a belief and a perspective that I also bring with me in my role with the school district. I truly believe that our community does amazing things when we come together and support each other. At the Alamosa School District, we understand how important a community relationship is, and we want to be partners and continue to build up our community. Before working for the school district, I worked at the 700 Main Street building that we're talking about for almost 10 years. And so I know firsthand how wonderful it is to be a part of that environment and I'm excited to show our guests everything downtown Alamosa has to offer. During my time at Alamosa School District, we have hosted the Colorado Association of School Boards, Colorado Department of Education, contractors and architects from the Front Range, speakers for our professional development days, and monthly we host the Superintendent's Advisory Committee to SLV BOCES with superintendents from all over the valley. So I feel like the potential purchase of this building gives us a great opportunity to bring more people into the central business district and further strengthen our relationship with the city. So I really hope that we can work together and continue to strengthen our bond and make our community the best that it can be. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Marillo. Hello, I'm Luis Murillo. As assistant superintendent, I get to work within our system and with our community to create the conditions for staff to teach and students to do their best learning. In 2024, the word teaching encompasses so much more than teaching students to read, write, and do math. Teaching requires creating the conditions within each individual classroom for all students to feel welcome, be seen, and feel a sense of belonging. I'm also a former school counselor and a mental health counselor and as a district leader, I am a firm believer that we must reach hearts before we are welcome into students' minds. There is a growing body of evidence that points to the impact of spaces in the learning environment for students. 
We know that small spaces are not conducive to students doing their best learning. We also know that cluttered spaces have the potential to trigger a student who might have experienced trauma. We also know that lighting, good airflow, and natural light have an effect on the mood of all of us. It's been our intent and continues to be our intent to create the very best conditions for learning to happen for all students. Our current space creates limitations and to be honest, frustrations, because I know that we can do better. In my role, I also have the privilege to visit other communities and tour other school districts and their facilities. I have seen what alternative schools can look like, how they feel, and the outcomes they can produce. As a proud Alamosan by choice, not by chance, I always think about why not us? Why not our kids? And why not our community? Tonight, we have a chance to take a step to get us closer to helping us provide the very best conditions for the magical work of teaching and learning to occur in a space that has the potential to be the potential to be as magical as our students. I highly encourage you to continue your support of the Alamosa School District as we continue to bring about the promise of a high quality public education for all. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Jones. Good evening, Mayor and Councilman. I'm Diana Jones. As the Superintendent of Alamosa School District, I thank you for your time and consideration of the code variances, allowing us to utilize this 700 main building as office space and as educational use. As you, you have heard this evening, the staff and students of the Alamosa Online and Alamosa Alternative School are all passionate about the environment, the need for space, and especially about the culture of support that continues to save lives and develop productive citizens in our community. The Alamosa School District is moving on a positive trajectory. The, the success of our schools has a direct reflection on the growth and success of the entire Alamosa community. We are extremely proud of our progress. Our students and staff are to be commended for their tireless work and continued effort. We are honored to be residents and contributors to the city and county of Alamosa. We are also proud of the partnerships developed throughout our community. As a superintendent of Alamosa School District, it is not lost on me, and I am fully aware that strong schools equal a strong community. We commit to continuing the positive trajectory and being active community partners. We ask each of you to approve the code variances. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. All right, so we went through the comment card. So now we're going to uh, go in line to the Zoom participants. Uh, for those of you who are on Zoom, uh, if you would like to be recognized during the citizen comments section, Right here, we ask that you click on the raise your hand feature uh, at the bottom of your screen so that you can be recognized um, and we would allow you to speak and we'll let you know when that three minute time limit. Up. So now is the time to raise your hand if you're on Zoom and you would like to make any comments at this time. Ms. Harry, I don't see any hands raised to you. Okay, so I'll go ahead and close this segment of the agenda, bring it back over to staff for follow up. I'm gonna turn it back over to staff. Sorry, I was looking up at the screen and wondering if maybe Councillor Carson had joined, but I was told he has not. So um, I apologize for that. Um, the comments made, I'll refer to items that will be discussed in more detail later on, except for one, which was um, some comments related to our website. Um, we'll take a look to see how navigating to find the minutes and, and look into that and see if that is, is user-friendly. In regards to um, 
comments that that council receives through emails and and any kind of form on the website or things like that um those are public records and if anyone ever wanted to make a request for for those records we can provide that the um, clerk's office has um, a records request form um, and they can walk them through that putting information on our website of everything that's a public record or all that it, it would inundate our our website and maybe potentially make it less user friendly um and easy to navigate but anytime individuals have questions like that we can obviously get answers um but to make sure tonight that it, that it's clear is those emails that council receives um officially as council members those are public records and if individuals are interested in seeing that they can submit a request for those records and the city attorney's light is on for some reason okay right because actually when that comment came up i whispered to heather that that was a fascinating comment and it's a fascinating comment from a legal perspective because not all emails to counselors are public records uh it's a kind of a nuanced issue but there are emails wherein the, the citizen or constituent may have some expectation of privacy in that communication. So what it raises is, is there some way for us to make clear uh, for a person sending an email to choose, hey, am I sending an email wherein I have an expectation of privacy? Uh, and some of that can be communication about very personal things having to do with the city's reaction to that person. Or is it an email that's a more generalized comment that, uh, number one, I may not have an expectation or deserve an expectation of privacy in, or number two, I may not want an expectation, I may want it to be public record. So we'll think about that. It's a, it's a fascinating comment. Okay. All righty. It brings us to the next item on the agenda, ceremonial uh, items, a proclamation of national disability and Employment Awareness Month here on Alamosa City Council. Uh, we rotate in reading proclamations, and tonight we have uh, Councilor Yan Vigil who's going to uh, read the proclamation. But before he starts, do we have anyone here uh, on behalf of National Disability Employment Awareness Month? If so, uh, please come up to the podium. And if you want to state your names and say a few words, you're more than welcome to. And then uh, we'll have Councillor Jan Vigil read the proclamation and then City Council and uh, Councillor Vigil will go down and present uh, the proclamation to you. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> My name is Amy Raya and um, I work with the Salinas Valley BOCES. I am the School to Work Alliance Program Coordinator. So we have um, October's National Disability Awareness Month. As you know, the BOCES, that's what they do. It's students on IEPs. And so um, I am the chair of TIGERS, which is the Transition Interagency um, Realization of Self. And so what we do every October is we thank employers who have either hired Paid, done paid work experience, job shadows, internships, apprenticeships with students that are aged 15 to 24, um, job, just job placement. And so um, this month we did four employers. And so those employers are recognized with a plaque, with a cool swag bag, they get some PR. And we just thank them for continuing to work and partner with us to hire those youth. And so when we talk about youth with disabilities or anybody, adults, older adults, um, younger adults. October, 61 million adults in the U.S. live with a disability. 10.8% um, of those adults have a disability that makes it hard to concentrate, remember things, or make decisions. But 61 million American adults have disabilities. And so when we're talking about disabilities, we're talking about vision, hearing, uh, learning, mobility, mental health, medical, physical, or hidden disabilities. Uh, one in four women have a disability. Even they, uh, the statistics show that one in four adults have a disability. So think about everybody in this room. One in four of us have a disability. There can, it can be as simple as asthma, um, ADHD. It could be a learning disability, reading, math. Um, it could be vision, hearing impairment. Um, also, 13.7% of people have difficulty walking or climbing stairs, which is also known as a mobility disability. 
So we want to recognize um, October is National Disability Awareness Month to remind employers to hire to hire youth and young adults, and not just youth and young adults, but adults in general um, that have disabilities. And so here with me as a representation, not only do I work with those youth and young adults from 15 to 24 that have disabilities, but I have Marie Harrelson. She's from the Workforce Center. I have Esteban Lupan from the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. And Stacy um, I Holland, I have her from the San Luis Valley BOCES. And so if they all want to say something, they can. But I just want to remind everybody that, you know, whether it's hidden or people have learned to self-accommodate, whether it's post-secondary in the community or even in education, they've learned to have accommodations and people have um, worked in each type of environment. They've just needed an accommodation to help them succeed in that goal that they have chosen. Okay. You said it all for all us. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank Perfect. you. Okay. We're going to have Councilor Young V. Hill read the proclamation. Thank you, Mayor. National Disability Employment Awareness, recognizing and commemorating October as National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Whereas people with disabilities can make significant contributions to Alamosa's economic and social well being, but face barriers to employment denying them the opportunity to use their skills and perspectives and depriving employers of the talent they need to grow. And whereas as Alamosa focuses on promoting a thriving employment environment with opportunity for every American to prosper, it's critical that it be powered by inclusion, providing people with disabilities the support they need to pursue their career goals, live independently and achieve financial prosperity. And Whereas as they enter, re-enter, or need support to remain in the workforce, Colorado workers with disabilities can benefit by visiting one of the offices of the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment's Division of Vocational Rehabilitation and or Alamosa Workforce Center, which partners with the state's 52 workforce centers and nine certified independent living centers. And whereas the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation School to Work Alliance Program and the Alamosa Workforce Center can provide no cost customized workforce development services to workers with disabilities, connecting them with employment opportunities, educational and training opportunities, assistive technology and more, while collaborating with business and other government and nonprofit organizations to fully integrate citizens of Alamosa living with disabilities into the workforce. And whereas many Alamosa employers, including the state of Colorado, understand the value that people with disabilities bring to the workplace, their example encourages others to create inclusive talent management practices to the benefit of workers with disabilities, businesses, and local, state, and regional economies. And whereas these employers know that hiring from this talent pool is more than doing the right thing, it is doing the smart thing. When employers create a culture of belonging for all of their talent, the dividends that are paid back to the company and to Colorado are significant. And whereas our communities and our economy are at the best when all people, including people with disabilities, can earn an income and become independent just like anyone else. And whereas activities during this month will reinforce the value and talent people with disabilities add to our workplaces and communities and affirm Colorado's commitment to an inclusive community that increases access and opportunities to all, including individuals, individuals with disabilities. Therefore, be it resolved that the city of Alamosa recognizes and commemorates that October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month, and be it further resolved, the City of Alamosa call upon employers, schools, and other community organizations in Alamosa to observe with appropriate program observe October with appropriate programs and activities, and to advance its important message that people with disabilities add value and talent to our workplaces and communities. And be it further resolved that the city of Alamosa pledges to continue to take steps throughout the year to recruit, hire, retain, and advance 
individuals with disabilities and work to pursue the goals of opportunity, full participation, economic self-sufficiency, and independent living for people with disabilities given under the mayor's hand and seal of the city of Alamosa on this 16th day of October, 2024. Thank you, Councilor Jan Vigil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's rock and roll. All righty. Next item on the agenda: Consent ca Calendar A. Council Young B. Hill. Mayor, I move that we approve Consent Calendar A. Okay, we have a motion. I second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Um, my device isn't working. It's not allowing me to close out. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and, oh, let me see, it might work. Okay. Yeah, let's do a voice vote. All right, we'll go ahead and do a voice vote down this row. Councilor Jan Hill, yes. Councilor Jackie B. Hill, yes. Mayor Ty Coleman, yes. Councilor Liz Hensley, yes. Councilor Jamie Dominguez, yes. Councilor Don Krebs, yes. Okay, thank you. That brings us to the next item on the agenda under regular business. Business brought forward by uh, city staff, first reading, an introduction to ordinance number 27-2024, an ordinance amending the Unified Development Code with respect to lighting. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of council. We have a presentation for this evening. I will say that this is the culmination of probably over three years of work for San Luis Valley Great Outdoors. And um, although we did not do the Herculean lift of the outreach that San Luis Valley Great Outdoors did, we have been in talks with them towards this, towards tonight for almost that same amount of time. So if you'd like to go to the second page, please. Okay, so we're gonna go over how we got to tonight because it's been a pretty long process. Um, we're gonna talk about what dark skies um, initiative is and why it's important to Alamosa and the San Luis Valley. We'll discuss uh, what the Planning Commission recommended, and then we'll go over the two proposed dark sky ordinances and how they're different. Next slide, please. Okay. So San Luis Valley Great Outdoors has been working towards establishing the Sangre de Cristo Dark Sky Reserve. So it'll be over 6,000 square miles. It has eight counties um, and there's a core, which is basically the Great Sand Dunes National Park and Preserve and portion of the Sangre de Cristos. Uh, the Great Sand Dunes National Park and Preserve has already been established as a dark night sky park by the DSI. Um, and then 
one of the rules in creating a reserve is that 80% of the surrounding population has to participate and adopt the goals um, as regulated by DSA. And so uh, we are part of the 80%. In fact, we're the bulk of the 80% of the surrounding population because we're the largest city. So next, please. Okay, so um, kind of a steps going forward. Staff is pretty neutral on this. I mean, we understand that policing it is kind of a lot of work. Um, it's also a regulation, which is generally not popular, we've noticed. Um, but at the same time, this does come from community need. Um, community has really reached out to council a lot. There were some really impassioned public comments over the years. Um, this has been an incredibly long timeline just because we have wanted the grassroots effort and the community to be natural. We wanted SLV Go to go out and really get the communities to support lighting regulations. We did not want it to come from the city. Um, it's too much to ask for it to be something that's led by staff. Um, beyond that, they've worked really tirelessly with DSI, which is the regu which is the organization that gives this designation to sort of craft this language. And sometimes getting a response from DSI can take months. So um, even after our last work session, getting a response from DSI on some of the questions council had, it, it took almost as long as it, um, towards the end of the summer. And so that's, that's part of why this process has drug out for so long. Um, and then again, as we're moving forward with this staff, looking at our land use code and the things that we really consider and we talked about a lot in our Novus communication to council is whether or not these rules are enforceable, both hypothetically and with resources and expertise. Is it achievable? Does this get us the goal that we want to um, achieve in our community in terms of protecting our night skies? And then is it a legitimate government community interest? You know, this can't just be something that's a whim of staff. It really has to represent the needs and wants of our community. Next, please. Okay, so planning commission, um, there was a, a fair amount of uh, turnout from the public, lots of comments in support, lots of comments that uh, from business owners in particular that were not in support. Um, and then some people that were kind of neutral that were, you know, would show up and say, hey, I really support protecting our night skies. They're singular in their beauty and we should protect them, but I'm not crazy about regulations. So um, they did request our planning commission would like a lighting survey. We don't have the funds to do that, but SLV Go has, um, I think, looked into some resources maybe to help us with that. Uh, they did believe that some of the rules that DSI has requested we adopt having to do with uh, curfews, that means turning your lights off at a certain time, and also the restrictions it would put on our signage. Planning Commission had a lot of issues with. Um, there were concerns about enforcement capacity. There were concerns about the effect on first responders and public safety. Um, there was a comment about interactions with wildlife and whether or not, because we have such a large deer population, if that would affect, um, if that would be part of the problem. Um, and then also just protecting our business owners and their ability to advertise even when they're closed. So next, please. Okay. So we have two versions. They're color-coded for my own benefit, but for everyone else's as well. Um, so the less strict version really is a product of the work session we had with council and the public hearings we had with the planning commission. So it is um, language that we think that Alamosa can absorb and that it, uh, isn't too much of a lift for staff to be able to enforce. And then there's a DSI version. Um, and this is language that's actually gone to DSI for them to approve and is sort of the language that they need us to adopt. And so we can't say with all, um, we can't say definitively that us not adopting the DSI regulations will kill the reserve. So before we had our work session with council, that's what DSI had told us. So this organization said, we will not give you the designation if you can't get Alamosa on board. If Alamosa does not adopt these rules exactly how we've written them, they can't. we can't help you establish the reserve. Council asked us to reach out to DSI again. SLV Go actually is the one that talks to them. And they sort of responded, do the best you can with Alamosa, you know, we need them to be involved, but we'll work with what we can. So we have an ambiguous answer. We just don't know. And so ultimately moving forward, we just need to decide what's best for our community while weighing you know, whether or not our decision will affect the overall reserve. Next, please. 
Okay. Um, so these are both in both versions of your ordinances because you have two versions. Um, these are the things that are the same. So the purpose of the lighting section is just that these are outdoor lighting requirements and we're trying to minimize glare and obtrusive light and protect the natural environment. So all the good things, everybody's in support of those things. Um, then we also want responsible outdoor lighting. We want it to be warm colored because that's um, better for reducing light pollution, low level control, useful. Um, we want the light to shine where it's actually needed. That's one of the most important tenets of any dark sky regulations is just, you don't need light that shines up into the sky because that doesn't illuminate anything and it doesn't help anybody. Next, please. Okay, um, all fixtures would be shielded. Basically what I just said, nobody needs light that shines straight up into space. Um, so all fixtures produce no more than 500 lumens. Currently our code says 1500 lumens. We do have an illustration on the next slide that should help with that a little bit because I know none of us know what 500 lumens are. Um, and then color max is 3000 Kelvin. Again, warmer colors, they're just less obtrusive. And then um, anything that's brighter than 500 lumens has to have timers, dimmers, and motion sensors. So you can have brighter lights, but they just have to be controlled. Next, please. This is our illustration. Um, so the middle one is kind of what we're talking about with 500 lumens. So, and it's an approximation. There's a science to this. If Deacon was here, he would explain it very, very well that I'm just not as technically adept as he is. So next, please. Okay. Um, Electronic message centers are only allowed on freestanding signs. We have a handful of those. Um, we have actually gotten some complaints on light pollution from those as well. So that's something realistically we would have addressed even if they weren't pursuing the dark sky reserve designation. Greenhouse lighting, you can operate. Um, if you operate between sunset and sunrise, you can't be visible from the outside, whether that means you do blackout curtains or turn your lights off, that's up to the person that operates the greenhouse. Um, Construction triggers, we have this for a lot of the improvements in our land use code. So basically, if you expand your building by 20%, which is pretty significant, or if your improvements to the building are greater than the cost of the building themselves, then you you, you change the lighting standards. Um, so we need you to submit details about the lighting when you submit building permits, which was one of the conversations we had about staff capacity, about whether or not we have the in-house expertise to review lighting standards. We think that we do. Um, and then beyond that, there's just, you know, the housekeeping stuff. So definitions, et cetera. Next, please. Okay. So this is, this is the fun part. I'm glad we have a full house so we can bore everyone equally, but these are uh, code changes. So the version that's um, sort of supported by council and the planning commission was uh, supportive of externally illuminated signs to be lit from the top. So it, it's lit from the top, shines down instead of shining up or out. Um, and then you have an 80 square foot luminous surface. So then the further that DSI is requesting is that you have to turn off your signs by 10 PM or one hour after you close which planning commission and council were not as supportive of, and that your sign brightness can't be brighter than 500 nits, which again, we're not light experts, but as far as we can tell is like the brightness of an iPhone screen. Next, please. Um, the next electronic message centers, 80 square feet, um, automatic dimming capabilities. Um, and then again, the DSI wants you to have the 500 nits, which is the brightness of an iPhone screen. So. Next, please. Um, the DSI compliant version requires that you have a dark or opaque background and brighter letters. Next, please. Um, string lighting, low voltage, landscape lighting, holiday lighting are exempt from these lighting regulations. So that's great. Um, the DSI compliant version requires that you can't be more than 500 lumen. So we kind of looked at that, it's like a 40 watt bulb. Um, you can't exceed 2000 lumens if you're in a residential area for string lighting. We did research that holiday lighting usually is not more than 100 lumens. Um, light intensity shouldn't be half of a foot candle. Again, some of these terminology, I'll do my best to explain them, but like they're, they're pretty technical. Um, in our Novus communication, we did actually clarify that if staff, if we do adopt these lighting regulations, there's like a specialized tool that we'd have to use to measure lighting that's um, a couple thousand dollars. So 
it is it is kind of a big push. Um, decorative and seasonal lighting must be off by 10 p.m. So the string lights we have on San Juan and Christmas lighting would have to be turned off. And so again, this these the second group of regulations, this comes from Dark Sky International. It doesn't come from the city. It's not part of our work session recommendations, but we felt that it was important because potentially the reserve is at risk to present both. Next, please. Um, flagpole fixtures, you have to actually point at the flag and not space. Um, and then the DSI, you can only have uh, unshielded lights for historic preservation purposes. And then um, they did create maximums of how much light you can have per property. And so our concerns with that from staff are like when you're thinking about a car dealership. So they have a lot of lights for safety reasons and, you know, trying to regulate how many, how many lumens per property is, is kind of a lot. Um, and then flagpoles can't exceed 800 lumens. Next, please. Or we might be done. We're done. So it's it's kind of a lot to absorb. Um, it's why we had so much public outreach. I know it's been a while since councils actually put eyes on these regulations. Um, where staff has always sort of stood on this is we do have exceptional night skies. They are beautiful. We want to protect them for future generations. We believe that any regulation that council passes makes a difference and ultimately protects our night skies so they're there for future generations. Whether or not we can sacrifice like the diversity of our signage in downtown or whether or not we have the policing power to enforce a curfew or whether or not we have the technical expertise to be out there measuring foot candles and lumens, those things are questionable. And so staff is supportive of the, the less strict version, um, but at the same time, we, we understand the consequences it could have. And we do understand that the reserve is, you know, a singularly important thing and could be very important for economic development and represents, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours of work at SLV Go. So that is the end of my presentation. And I just wanna add from a, from a strategy perspective, um, as, as Rachel pointed out, when we went into that work session with council, the, the information we were getting from DSI was pretty black and white. Either Alamosa does this and the designation can happen or Alamosa doesn't, and the entire area can't be designated. And as, as Rachel pointed out, when they reached out to them again, it's a little more wishy-washy. Um, there still is very much a risk there. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to minimize that. But the thing I wanted to point out is, is before there maybe wasn't much much strategy on changing anything. Like if we're not going to get it, then why change anything? And I, I, I would say them being a little more wishy-washy might change that strategy a little bit in that. It might have some value of changing some that we are comfortable with to show that we are friendly towards the night skies and, and that we are trying to work to support this effort. And so um, I just wanted them giving a slightly different answer to that um, changed a little bit for me as far as a recommendation on if there's any value in adopting some of the um changes in order to be friendly. That's not to minimize the risk of not adopting all of it. I'm just adding that last little bit. Okay, thank you, uh, Councilor Hensley. So thank you for the presentation. Also during our work session, which I found very educational, um, there was, it was sh shown obviously um, how certain lights, if they shine a certain way, they actually, make it harder to see versus it was a really good presentation. And so I learned a lot about lighting because at first I really didn't know. So I guess I wanted to also say there was a lot that we learned in our work session in regards to lighting. Um, with all that being said, I think that balance, um, I think obviously doing our due diligence and doing our best to uh, keep the night, uh, night sky, the dark sky and things like that. And obviously, maybe making this more of a gradient versus all in all at once. So I am supportive of the non DSI version, which does show, um, and I think is very beneficial and it, it is not, it's just making adjustments and changes as we move forward, but shouldn't have any major costs or anything right off the bat. Thank you, Councilor Hensley. Okay, uh, Councilor Cripps. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Um, 
I'm a huge dark skies person. And um, I agree with Councillor Hensley in the fact that as, as much as I read up on dark skies, that work session we had was so educational about what they were looking for and what we could do as a city to step up and be a part of that. And so I was disappointed to, to hear that as a community, we were, we were very large and there was pushback from businesses and, and well understood for that. And so I am very glad to hear that there is a little bit of wiggle room with, with that. I would love to support the very strict version, but um, I, and, and become a true dark skies international, but I'm also well aware of um, the business owners in the area. And I think that the version A is a great first step in that direction to show people visually what it means to be close to a dark skies community. And I think that I, I agree. I, I do appreciate version A. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Cribs. <laughs> Councilor um, Dominguez, sorry. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Um, I approve the non-DSI version too. I think this is us doing our best at this point in time, considering like the workloads involved with agreeing to the other one. So I'm safe with that one for now. Okay, I don't see any other lights. All right, I'll make an attempt here. I move to approve version A, the less strict version of ordinance number 27-2024 and an ordinance amending the unified development code with respect to lighting. I second. We have a motion, we have a second. Any further discussion? And see, that it, motion assumes that we're then setting it for public hearing on um, November November 6th. November 6th. What he just said. <laughs> we have a motion, a second, no further discussion. Please start voting. We might be missing somebody. Can you push your green? There you go. Thank you. The motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Ariel. Okay, thank you, Ms. James. That brings us to the next item on the agenda. First reading and introduction, uh, ordinance number 30, 2024, an ordinance amending the Unified Development Code to allow schools in the Central Business District by conditional use with certain limitations. One of the really beautiful things about our land use code is that it is a living document. And so we can always look at rules that don't make sense or as our community needs evolve over time, we can come back before our decision-making bodies and council and amend them. And so tonight we're talking about an amendment to our UDC, so to the code itself. Um, when it came to our attention that the school district was interested in moving to 700 Main, we thought they were moving at their administration offices as professional business offices, which it had already been an office building. So even though it's technically not allowed, it was a grandfathered use, so legally non-conforming. And um, it wasn't until later that we found out that they also were moving their alt-ed and online school. And so then it became a conversation about um, moving an education use to the downtown. And it was complicated a little bit by the fact that there was the liquor license restriction. So you can't have a liquor license within 400 or 500 feet, depending on different criteria, which is actually a different topic we'll discuss next. Um, and so even though um, the Planning Commission and City Council really does support uh, alternative education and the online schools. It wasn't necessarily the conversation we were having. The conversation was the use in the downtown. And so after a really productive work session last week, we kind of fast-tracked bringing this ordinance before council so that um, to be sensitive to the fact that the school district is trying to purchase the building. And they've gone through quite a lot to buy it from bankruptcy attorneys from Friday Health Plans. And um, what I want to be very, very clear about, though, is that the decision that we're that council is making tonight is not about 
the, the school district purchasing 700 Main Street and whether or not the use for them particularly is allowed. The change that we're proposing tonight as staff by this ordinance is to allow educational uses in general in the central business district. So it's just an important nuance. And then the school district can apply and actually already has applied. We've allowed them to move up their timeline a little bit, but they have applied for a conditional use permit. And the conditional use permit will go before the planning commission at their regularly scheduled meeting next week. And then it'll be ratified by council on November 6th. So that's how the process goes. So even though there's a lot of impassioned public comment about the school district's building in particular, that's not what we're here tonight to decide. We're just deciding the change to the code itself. And so the change to the code itself proposes that we do allow um, educational and online school uses in our central business district, provided that they follow the same criteria as a professional business district, which in the CBD just means they need to be above the ground floor. That's basically the gist of it. And that's actually only between uh, Hunt Avenue and Addison Avenue. So those are, those are the rules. A conditional use is sort of a special mechanism in our land use code where sort of in a unique um, type of a zoning where it's sort of outside of the norm and we wanna be able to put conditions on it. And so conditions might take the form of um, what Councillor Carson discussed at our last meeting, that a certain portion, a certain percentage of the first floor be dedicated to retail. So it, it gives the planning commission and staff the ability to uh, recommend conditions for this actual use to allow it downtown. And then of course the use, whether it's allowed and the conditions for that use will come before council and council can reject it. So, I mean, theoretically you do have a say even though the public hearing uh, happens at planning commission. So it's not an easy case, it's pretty complicated. Um, but again, we try to be responsive to the needs of the public. I think that this was thoroughly vetted by the Main Street Committee, by City Council, by members of the community. And tonight, the thing that we need to discuss is whether or not we're willing to actually change our code in order to allow them to apply for a conditional use. And Rachel, I'm sorry, I, I hate to put you on the spot like this. Um, but I also think last week as, as we were really trying to dig into how can we condense the process and, and, and what the conditional use means and, and all of those types of things, I think Deacon, as he was re-reviewing the downtown plan, that there is mention in it that at some point the city should evaluate if um, a education, certain educational uses are appropriate in the downtown. It just didn't tackle it when the, when the downtown plan was put together. And so I do think that is somewhat important because I, I know one of the concerns from the Main Street Committee was it's not in the downtown plan. And, and as it is, it, it currently is not allowed, but it was mentioned that the, that there could be some appropriateness if it was looked at closely. And, and so I just wanted to share that. Is that a correct summary of it? wrote a note on my wrong ordinance about it. So yes, that's exactly right. So under the regulatory tools part of our downtown plan, it says specifically that we should amend the zoning for our central business district to allow certain educational uses. Specifically, they were hoping that ASU or Trinidad would have facilities downtown. And then ultimately when council moved to adopt a bunch of the recommendations from the downtown plan, they omitted the education portion because they were worried about the liquor license rule. But there's a nice loophole that our attorney has helped us find where we can specifically exclude types of uses in the CBD. So that again, it's an item we're dealing with next, but that was the only reason it wasn't included in the changes to our code before is just because they were worried it would interfere with liquor licenses. And this is information we had not been able to provide to the Main Street Committee because it's something we discovered just last week. Yes. If only Aaron Miltenberger was still here. Okay. It's not a loophole, just to, yeah. I, I, <laughs> it's tomato, tomato. part of the plan to devolve local control to where it belongs, which is with the city council. That's what I said. That's what I heard. All right. Okay. Council, you have a video. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Rachel, at the beginning of your comments, you said, what was a breathing document, a living breathing document? The our uniform development code. Okay, our UDC. And then can you also say then that our downtown plan is a living, breathing document? It is going to be amended when we do our comp plan update. 
So okay. it will it will evolve in the sense that professionals will come in and do new outreach to our community, and it will reflect the changing attitudes and how much we've grown in the last five years. And yet the ultimate decider is us seven up here. Yes. Okay. I just want that to be known for the public. Um, I want to talk about real quick the uh, the conditional use permit, which we're going to talk about tonight, and then how you guys tried to move it up as quickly as possible. Um, can you comment more on that and kind of how that went down, and can we make it even faster than that? Well, can I talk a little bit? Because I, I I feel like I was as confused as anyone else. And, and so Deacon and Rachel, after the work session last week, really explained it to me. And so... This conditional use, it's it's almost a two-step process. And, and so the first step is we need to discuss, and that's what's before you tonight, is does educational use get added as a conditional use in the central business district? It's not specific to the project that the school district is looking at. So um, that's what's before you tonight for first reading, and then obviously there'd be a second reading. The second step is assuming you approve this, then the school district needs to bring their actual project through the process. And that starts with the planning commission that holds a public hearing. It's also at that time that this idea of conditions would be very specific to this project. So if hearing from the public or the planning commission in and of itself feel that there should be some conditions, Rachel's example she gave was Councillor Carson's mention of the first floor retail. It's at that time that kind of specificity is brought up. And, and planning commission would hold the hearing, make a recommendation to city council. The way we've shortened it is, is, is normally we would want you to do your second reading on this topic, that it is going to be an allowed conditional use before the actual project starts working its way through. But given the time frame that the school district has for, for closing on the building, it's going to put it into December type of situation if we did that. So that's why next week we start the project specific part going to planning commission. So then your November 6 meeting, you will have second reading on this one, assuming it's approved. You'll have second reading on the liquor license, and then you will have consideration of the planning commission's recommendation on the project itself. So it's all going to hit on your November 6th meeting. And the school board knows all these timelines and what, what's the, all that stuff. Yes. Okay. Um, do you foresee the planning and zoning commission recommending conditions? I do. Like what? Probably, um, from what we've gleaned from them, probably a retail component, which the Moose store, as the school district has discussed, would be reasonable. Um, and then beyond that, some sort of an open house. So when they're ready to move in, just opening the first floor or something to the community so that the other downtown business owners have a chance to see what the building's going to look like. I, it's a... They just wanted them to be better neighbors. And I think that was one of the things that came out of planning commission kind of strongly was that they wished that there'd been more time and a little bit more outreach. Um, one of our planning commission members does work at ASU and talked about when they were doing the remodel of Richardson Hall, they opened it up to the public and they showed the public what the building was gonna be. And they felt like it was, a. they didn't necessarily change their plans, but they just gave the public an opportunity to see what their plans were. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Young V. Hill, uh, Councilor Hensley. So I am, um, so I'm on the main street. I'm the representative obviously from city council on the main street board. I, um, and I'm really pro economic development. Um, but I also, the way I look at this is things always adjust. They always change things could five years from now could be something different than today. Um, I am very supportive of this change. I think it's one of those things where I look at it and we still keep that focus on retail. Um, I like the idea that so far, and I know we're not supposed to, this is more about this versus what Alamosa School is doing, but obviously they've talked about the Moose um, retail part of it, which technically they really don't have to do because they are grandfathered in. So being that good neighbor and looking at it from that perspective. The other thing I will say, um, I am at Adam State and one of the biggest um, challenges we've been working on for a long time. So with my Adam State hat and working with the city 
is how to get more young people downtown. Um, and so we've been working on that from um, the idea of, uh, we're working on a huge project right now um, with Adam State to really asking the students what would, get, what would drive them to be downtown more. I have to tell you, as I think about growing, I didn't grow up here obviously, but growing up where I did, we were part of the downtown and so it became natural for us. And I do think when you look at it, that idea that isn't something that's really happening for our downtown. It's not something where our youth are like, oh, let's go downtown and, and be there and stuff. Where I think this is a first step to honestly, that idea at that younger age of them feeling comfortable being downtown so that it actually develops more consumers as well. So I just see from so many perspectives why this is a positive. So anyway, I am in support of this. Thank you, uh, Councilor Hensley, Councilor Jackie V. Hill. Well, I grew up here and when I was young, downtown was everything for us. We, we had the movie theaters downtown. Um, we had restaurants downtown, we cruised downtown. And so, I mean, it's important to get that back to Alamosa, you know, that was so important to us. That was what we looked forward to every weekend. So I am in support of this also. Okay, um, Councillor uh, Dominguez. Yes, um, I'm also in support of this. Um, I, the stories that were shared with the youth, I just want to thank them for coming up. That's brave, and I know that we're just talking about the first step here, but this is very important to all of us as a community. Um, these are the young individuals who patronize downtown right now, and I think showing them the respect that they or families have showed the rest of us is our due diligence as a as a council and to entertain a living document, it exists like that because obviously there is gonna be room for change no matter what we write down in stone in our lives. And I've learned that just living 47 years on this rock. So I'm in support of that. Thank you. Um, so Councillor Hensley, then Councillor- uh, I'm gonna make a motion. Okay. Well, I just wanna, I wanna just reiterate my comments from last week that I highly support this. We are community uh, partners with the with the county commission, with Adam State, Trinidad, the school board, like the school district, we need to be a good partner here. Um, and I think this is a win-win for everybody, for all those businesses in that part of downtown. As the school district said last week, this is 20 to 25 adults in that building every day who are gonna be hungry and want coffee and want whatever, like plus the students. And what, what I know, I think we'll talk about this at a later time with the liquor again. It's it's the job of the of the business to card people so that they don't go buy alcohol. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Yaron V. Hill. Councilor Hensley. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move on first reading um, the approval of ordinance number 30-2024 and set the matter for a second reading and public hearing on November 6, 2024 at 7 p.m. or as soon thereafter as the matter may be heard. I second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, please start voting. Ms. Ariel? The motion carried unanimously. Awesome. Thank you. That brings us to the next item on the agenda. This is not a loophole. <laughs> what this, what this is, is that, um, and we're not we're not concerned about the youth having access to establishments with alcohol. It is literally written into state statute that you can't have, um, you can't issue new licenses within a certain distance to an education use, and so. Again, that it's sort of always been a non-starter to have education uses downtown because we need to be able to issue new liquor licenses for restaurants and other types of businesses. And so um, luckily state statute gives council the authority to either reduce or eliminate the distance restriction. And so what we're here to request is very, very simply is that, um, and, and it's actually not staff that's requesting it, it's actually the school district that's actually requesting it, which is very important that the school district is the entity that's moving downtown. They will be the educational use. They do not want to impact the ability for council to issue new liquor licenses. They don't want to interact, impact the, the vibrancy and the hospitality industries that we want in the downtown. So they have very specifically requested that council um, eliminate the distance restriction for alternative 
in secondary schools and online schools in the central business district. So that is the issue before council right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor uh, Hensley and then Councillor uh, Young Hill. I do have one question. So I do definitely see a huge difference between restaurants, things like that versus liquor stores. Um, and so with this, is this um, all encompassing or is it specific? That might be a good question for our attorney. This is all encompassing, but liquor stores are type two retail, which are not allowed in the CBD anyway. It's my recollection. I can look that up to confirm since Deacon's not here, but. That that was prior to. I literally had my use table with me for our work session, but took oh, it to my office. There's also distance restrictions in the state liquor code for retail liquor stores. So we technically can't issue any more in Alamosa right now. Downtown. Okay. okay. So I just want, like I say, for me, that would be just something to, to consider a little bit harder, like similar to the thing when the Boys and Girls Club with the dollar store type of situation. So we, with this change, um, it would... It, it wouldn't it we could still deny a liquor license to somebody obviously if we felt it needed to be denied things like that and so i just want to i just want to clarify the the interplay between um what holly has indicated and and what eric has indicated so obviously what what holly has said is correct but that distance requirement that also means if one of those liquor stores closes then that uh, potentially would allow the opportunity for a new liquor license to be issued within a certain distance. By population. Oh, it's by population. Population. Never mind. Okay, so just clarification. So this really is more than our restaurants and things like that, not liquor stores. So looking at the definition of retail type two, I am incorrect. Liquor stores are not listed there. It's not allowed to front Main Street. So you can't have, um, hold on. Clarification is great. We can look into it. Maybe we shouldn't be searching the code real time. Yeah, we can certainly look into that issue between these two. So you kind of know where my thoughts are, and I don't know if everybody else thoughts is the same way. So I guess what I would say, this is a first reading, so it gives us time. So I'm very supportive of this, but the only thing I would have that little bit of concern and not saying I would say no, but I would kind of want to protect against the liquor store part. Um, so with that, that's how I feel. And I think we can address that at the second reading. So then I move that we approve on first reading and set for a second reading and um, public hearing, ordinance number 29-2024. A second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, please start voting. The motion carried unanimously. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to the next item on the agenda. Second reading and public hearing for ordinance number 24-2024 and ordinance making the annual appropriations for fiscal year 2025. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I know that this is a presentation that, that you have seen before and some in the public have seen two times. Um, already so but I will go quickly because I do think it's important anytime we have an opportunity to review the big picture as it relates to the budget so the 2025 budget if we skip I'm not going to spend time on our vision and mission because we've got a late night 
Um, in regards to the city's organizational chart, the only note that I had there is that as an employer for the Alamosa community, we are at 249 city employees. You could, they're spread throughout all of these different divisions and, and departments. Of that, it's 120 full-time, 73 part-time volunteer year-round, 38 part-time and temporary, and then 18 seasonals. From a focus area perspective, it's both from a money, but then also the complexity of the issue and how much time and resources we're dedicating towards trying to figure it out. Housing has remained an important focus area. I think it's just very impressive that, that staff and our housing partners, since making this a priority, we've been able to funnel in just under $10 million in grants to try to address the housing crisis. Public safety with police and fire, looking at um, you know that relationship and the IGA with that we with the fire district, evaluating what our our volunteer pay is from a police perspective, looking at adding the sergeant, strengthening our co-responder and lead, um, and taking a look at some of our policies and and making changes where we think might need to be some changes. Infrastructure is always a big ticket item. Um, that covers almost every department, economic development, assisting our existing businesses, as well as any businesses looking to move to our community. And then obviously outdoor recreation over the last probably five or so years has just grown dramatically by leaps and bounds. From a budget overview, um, the city does its budget and it's, it's finances based on funds. And what I try to explain to people is if you think of it as a bucket, and so if we look at the street trust fund as an example, it has dedicated tax that goes in and that tax can only pay for certain projects. It cannot pay for police, it can't pay for fire, it can't pay for those other things. And so there's times though that we have one bucket, the general fund might transfer, for example, 500,000 to the street trust fund. And so in our budget, if anyone ever gets into the line items, there's times you will see transfers in between the funds type of situation. So going to the revenue slide, the city is anticipating bringing in just under 47 million. You can see about 55% of that is to the general fund. Enterprise fund is about 21%. And then um, community recreation is about almost 8%. And then the other funds are obviously much smaller slices of the pie. From an expenditure perspective, we are expecting to spend um, $53,726,443. Um, that is six million, almost seven million more than the revenue that we are bringing in. But these were anticipated capital projects that we had been saving up for, or just because of the timing of when the funding hits, but then when the project can actually happen, it's this is the year, is 2025. Um, so general fund, you can see how much from expenditures will go from a general fund perspective. Um, the enterprise fund, um, their revenue was 21%. Their expenses are going to be 26%. That's because a lot of these, ex these capital projects are happening out of the enterprise fund. And then you can see the smaller slices there. From a general fund perspective, um, we have two sales taxes that are the primary resource that, that funnel into it. The general fund gets pulled in a lot of different directions to pay for fire, police, park maintenance, part of street maintenance, um, portion of the library court, overall administration. And so we have the two sales taxes as well as about 650,000 in property taxes. I know with a lot of stuff going on at the state level um, with property taxes, we often get that question of how much do we rely on them? From a revenue perspective, um, the taxes represent about 42.6%.
we are only budgeting a two and a half percent increase in our sales tax. That's the lowest increase in sales tax we've budgeted since the 11 years that I've been here. We've really seen a flattening of spending um, from consumer perspective. Intergovernmental revenue, that big blue slice there, um, that's 42%, and that is grants. And the third biggest slice is that orange, it looks yellow up there, that's transfers. So that's when we're transferring in from our capital fund, that bucket. That's where we're transferring in um, for the other funds to cover the IT purchases and then cost allocations. The general fund expenditures, this um, pie graph unfortunately is a little misleading because development services looks like it's 40.8% of total expenditures. And normally they're one of our smaller slices. So of that $10 million that development services has in the budget, seven over 7 million is for housing. 1 million is a pass through for the early childhood. Um, about half a million is dedicated towards the levy and another million is for Hunt Avenue. So um, it's dramatically bigger because of all of those grants and projects um, funneling through that department. Normally, what our largest um, expenditures out of the general fund are our are, are public safety and um, our street maintenance. Public safety, if you add our police, fire, and, and the multiple divisions for police, we're just under six million. And then the street maintenance you can see is a little bit over two million. The next fund is our enterprise fund. This is our water, stormwater, wastewater, and sanitation. And so um, we go to the next slide and look at the revenue. Um, if you think of it as a bucket, the money that comes in, we have the charges for services that represents about 59% of the revenue coming in. As per the ordinance that council approved last year that set out the next five years for rate increases, sanitation, water, and sewer are all projected at a 5% increase. 2026, we are planning on doing a rate study because we it's time to renew that. The blue is the transfers in, um, about 2.7 million of that is the sales tax that we're transferring in um, to take care of some of the levy and to offset some expenses in the water treatment um, budget. And then that yellow part is the grants, we're expecting about 1 million in grants. The expenditures, um, you will see we are spending more than we are bringing in, about 4 million more. The capital expenditures represents about 51% of that budget. And then you can see operations, transfers out, benefits and personnel in their breakdown. The next fund is our street trust fund. It gets its money from a dedicated sales tax and then the general fund also transfers in half a million. So that pie chart is pretty simple. The next for the expenditures is the major ones for 2025 is the both phases of 2nd Street, as well as the design of West 7th Street, Washington Avenue to Tremont, our unassigned maintenance, that's our overlay slurry program, and then the concrete replacement. Our community recreation fund um, funds um, a Good portion of the Alamosa Library, golf operations, Alamosa Family Recreation Center, the ice rink multi-purpose building, um, trails, and numerous team sports, indoor and outdoor recreational. It is a dedicated sales tax that does not sunset. And if you look at the revenue, um, taxes are about $2 million. You can see golf revenue. That yellow slice is the grants representing just shy of 17% of the revenue coming in. And then from an expenditure perspective, um, you can see between library, golf course, and community recreation, how the pie gets split. 
Um, from a capital improvement, I'm not going over every single one of those numbers. I think the big number I wanna focus on is the total. We are doing almost $15 million in 2025 for capital projects. So that's purchasing vehicles, some of which is like a, a trash truck, which is about $240,000 to just your normal vehicle that might only be 50,000. Um, we've got facilities, um, both from an improvement perspective, as well as the construction of a new sanitation shop. Um, and then it also includes um, other capital projects that, that the public can see and some they may not see when we're doing the underground with the utility lines, lift stations, and those types of things. On the next page is probably what's of most interest to the public. And these are the major capital projects. So as I mentioned, when talking about the street trust fund, second street reconstruction is happening next year. Out of the general fund, we will have the Lakeview Avenue. We are timing that with the early childhood center. We've got Hunt Avenue that is mostly grant funded. Our water augmentation efforts, Murphy sewer lift station, utility infrastructure plan, a grant funded downtown alley project, facility improvements and vehicles, the new solid waste shop, Carroll Park dog park, a full wheelchair swing at Cole Park, the levee engineering and maintenance, the Boyd School and CRHDC housing projects, and then the early childhood education. And then the last slide I have is taking a look at the history of grants and donations. You can see beginning in 2018, we really went to that next level of getting into the millions. 2021, we took it even further, getting into 5 million. 2023 was a little crazy with 17 million and we've gone back down to just the 5 million, but um, the grants and donations have obviously become a big part of how we get some of these bigger projects done. Um, when the public thinks about some of the more exciting stuff that gets done, it is because of these grants. Otherwise, the operations are eating up a majority of, um, of the, the funds. The breakdown for 2024, because I think sometimes um, there's a misperception of how much money is going to different areas. The downtown um, in 2024 received grants in the amount of 2 million. Housing was 1.1, early childhood pass-through, public safety, parks and recreation and library, and then miscellaneous. And with that, Mayor, um, you have before you tonight the second reading and a public hearing. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Sanchez. Okay, so what we're gonna do is open up the uh, second reading uh, and public hearing for the second reading of ordinance number 2024-2024, an ordinance making the annual appropriations for fiscal year 2025. Uh, if we have anyone in the audience who would like to make any comments at this time regarding uh, this ordinance, please feel free to come up to the podium and make your comments and then we'll go to Zoom participants. Okay. Well, I'm David Broyles and uh, being that I've been on, in city council in the past and gone through the budget process, I do wanna say uh, I think the city's being very fiscal responsible, and I appreciate that. And I basically agree with the overall revenues and, ex and expenditures. And uh, so I, I appreciate the city and the city council for being fiscal responsible. And, and so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone in, else in the audience who would like to make any comments at this time before we go to the Zoom participants? Okay. I don't see anyone coming to the podium, so I'll go ahead and go to the Zoom participants. If you would like to participate in this public hearing, please uh, click on the raise your hand feature uh, that's on your screen so that you can raise your hand and be recognized, and then uh, we would allow you to make your comments. Okay. 
I don't see any hands raised, so we'll go ahead and close the public hearing and I'll bring it back to council. Councilor uh, Yunvi. Mayor, I would like to recognize Mr. Broyles' comments. He was on council for a, a few years and uh, a budget hawk had a, a really good eye for the budget at all, at all times. So uh, appreciate his comments on the on the budget. I move that we approve ordinance number 24-2024 on second reading and thank Heather and all of staff for all the work you guys did to put into the budget for this next year. Thank you, Councilor Yonvi Hill. I second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I just want to thank the staff and the entire team for all the hard work and commitment and dedication you put into uh, this budget. Um, keep up the great work. Start voting, everybody. The motion carried unanimously. Awesome. That brings us to the next item on the agenda. Motion setting new rules for St. Benedict. For some reason, I was going to the pay plan. So we'll do the we'll do the rules. I'm sorry, Mayor. Um, so based on the the public meeting that the City Council held, as it relates to if we should keep Saint Benedict or not, um, the outcome of that is a very tentative. Let's keep it, but let's take a look at um, increasing the rules and enforcement and then see what that does, both for the residents who are staying at St. Benedict and for the neighborhood surrounding it. Um, so based on that, council asked the Homeless Coalition to take a look at the rules and, and make some recommendations. The Homeless Coalition held two meetings, two hours each. So they spent at least four hours in a meeting, reviewing these, debating um, different words, the language, if something should be included, um, those types of things. So I definitely wanna um, give my appreciation to the Homeless Coalition because they took this very seriously and they really did dedicate a lot of time. That doesn't mean that their recommendation is set in stone. And so it's a very good place for you to take a look. And if you feel like changes need to be made, that's very much your prerogative um, at the same time. And I think um, if I kind of go through some of the rules now to start with, we already had rules at St. Benedict. So some of these are not necessarily new. They've just been developed more. And we've discussed maybe what the consequences should be. When one of the questions, and because this is going to come up multiple times, this concept of trespass, um, we do not have an on-site manager out there that would be a, a fairly significant cost, and La Puente does not have an on-site manager out there as, as well. How the campsite has been managed is the outreach, and, and that initiative has been done through La Puente Outreach, and then the other partners in the community are co-responders to try to build the relationship with the population and connect them to resources and, and those types of things. The enforcement side um, has been from our CSOs. And then obviously, if there's a, a higher level type of situation, our officers might have to respond as well. Um, so when we talk about trespass, what that means is us as the property owner, if we feel someone has violated one of our rules um, and should no longer be there, we have the ability to trespass someone off of our property. It's just like if, if Safeway wanted to trespass somebody, city market, all of that type of stuff. So we would issue notice to the individual that would most likely be our CSO since they're the enforcement arm. And then that person would not be able to stay at St. Benedict. Now, we're not there. And if they come to visit someone and during the day or things like that, it doesn't mean the same type of trespass that maybe they can't be there at all but it does mean they cannot be living there type of situation. Now, if they were there and, and got trespassed for one of the more serious ones, so um, when we had an individual set fire and we trespassed them, obviously we don't want them on the property period. And so this is where we rely on, on people who are out there to let us know our video cameras, those types of situations. And so that's what, what trespass means. And so 
as I get into the, to the rules. So we already had a liability waiver. Um, we had campsite rules acknowledgement. Um, we did not have a pet registration form. So we would still want the liability waiver. We'd want them acknowledging the new rules. And if they do have a pet, um, it was recommended that we have a pet registration form. From an individual site perspective, we wanted to make it clear that there are marked spaces and that they need to both remain in that individual site and they needed to keep their space clean. And then there's a lot of time spent on how do you define clean and what does that mean? And, and so the simplistic answer that we came up with is the CSOs took pictures of examples of campsites of what would be clean. And, and so that way we can have a visual when we're interacting with individuals that may not be meeting that standard. And so um, if it's not kept clean, they will get a notice of violation that allows them seven days to clean that up, move their possessions into one site. And if they don't, then they will be trespassed. The um, committee didn't feel like this was something that should be too hard to follow type of thing. Whereas some other ones, and especially when we talk about pets, there might need to be maybe a little bit more time type of situation. So, um, they just felt both from a public health perspective, the danger that can be caused when some of the items start accumulating um, as far as rodents and, and those types of things, as well as fire hazards, that it was, it was fairly important. Also, um, keeping the camp itself clean. There was a lot of debate on what should be required and not required. Um, part of the debate focused on if we require them to be a part of every monthly cleanup, what if someone has a job? Or what if someone was connecting with service providers or something like that? And, and so I think that was part of the thought of, okay, they need to participate at least once within a three month time frame. And again, this is not set in stone. So if that's not um, a threshold that, that council thinks is appropriate, that you can, you can obviously change it. Um, this expectation is to clean around areas that are the porta johns, the water area, the dumpsters. It's like that shared communal living area. The committee didn't think it was appropriate to force individuals to clean up an abandoned site. They wanted to continue the incentive program for that. Um, they felt like that's something where it's someone else's mess. The other individuals aren't responsible for that and, and they didn't wanna make that a requirement. So the requirement to clean is only for those shared areas, almost as if you were in a shared living environment, you would rotate maybe responsibilities of who's cleaning the restroom, who's cleaning the um, kitchen, those types of things. Um, from a fire perspective, most of it is the same. We did make it clear that charcoal and propane grills are allowed and that they need to be kept further than 10 feet from combustible structures, fences, or vegetation. Vehicles um, is not new. We just added language to make it clear that they can park in the designated parking area with the proper registration form. Pets probably took over an hour. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, essentially where we landed, where they landed a lot on the pets is trying to have the same standards and expectations that we have for the public in general. And that is pets are required to be vaccinated and re registered type of situation. Um, the other aspects is since this is a more of a, a multi-person living area, restraining the pets is also important as well to keep everybody safe. Um, the recommendation was to have them register their pets so we have knowledge of what pets are in there um, and that we can somewhat control what's going on in that area. And so um, when someone arrives, they have... What we have in there right now is 30 days to get the registration and the vaccinations. Um, we had a placeholder in this for quite a while because we weren't sure how easily someone could get their pet in to get vaccinated. Like how long does it take? What is the cost? Those types of things. 
during that time frame, I think there was discussions with the Dumb Friends League to where they will be doing certain things on a monthly basis. And with La Puente's participation, then there can be that vaccination as part of it. And, and so that's then when we plugged in 30 days. So I know that seems like a lot, but um, getting into a vet could take a few weeks and it could be much more expensive as well. So um, that's where we landed with 30 days to get it. If they didn't get it after two warnings, then they have failed to comply with it, then they are gonna be required to leave St. Benedict. So um, I think part of that's a recognition of they may have a lot going on, kind of maybe they moved in right after the first registration they miss the next one, so it's to try to give them another opportunity. But again, council can change this if you think one warning is enough, and if they don't comply, um, then you can ask them to leave. We felt it was important for pets to be under the control of the person who can physically restrain the animal at all times, and that might either be through a leash or some other mechanism. We also have in here that the length of the leash should be no more than 10 feet, if they're tethered, that needs to keep them to the dedicated space. After three violations, so if their dog is roaming at large after three violations, the pet privilege of having a pet will be revoked. And so if the owner does not remove the pet from St. Benedict, then they too will be asked to leave. Um, we have in here that all pets have to be provided with proper care, um, including basic needs like access to food, water, and shade. So if we are noticing a situation where the pet is not safe, we will have that conversation with the individual. Complaints of aggressive behavior um, are going to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. This one was kind of hard because sometimes uh, the reason a homeless person may have a pet is to, for protection and to protect their area. Um, but obviously if the pet is too aggressive and actually bites, then that right raises to a different level type of thing. But just actually barking at someone when they're coming towards their site um, is probably why the person has the pet type of thing. We also felt that given the conditions out there, um, in the shared living area, that there should be a limit on pet ownership, that there's only one per person. And then as we know, sometimes there may be persons living in the same tent. So it's two pets per space. So those two would be in effect. We also listed what pets are not allowed um, type of thing. And then we also have, um, if they have friends who come over, that the same rules apply to those friends if they bring pets. The next area is noise. Um, we're going to enforce quiet hours between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. That would be based on a complaint basis. We're not going to be out there checking on noise. From a criminal activity perspective, um, it's the suspicion of criminal activities. So we don't have to have burden of proof to trespass someone. You have to have burden of proof if we're going to issue a ticket from a law enforcement perspective. But if we have suspicion that someone as made in the, in the public meeting is the kingpin of the drugs, we may not have enough proof to issue a ticket, but we may not feel like we always need to have that level of proof. If we are out there and our service providers are telling us information, the residents out there are telling us information, we can trespass based on suspicion that there's criminal activity. And that includes the use and or distribution of illegal drugs. And it will could lead to immediate trespass. In regards to cooking meth, that's obviously a criminal activity. So that is covered by this. From a city property perspective, um, any tampering or destruction of city property will result in immediate trespass. This includes any damage to the porta johns, dumpsters, fencing trees, water supply, poles, electrical outlets, et cetera. Um, structures, we already had in there that there were not supposed to be any structures. It's only supposed to be tents. Bullying is something we added because of the public input received. Um, there was very much concerns about bullying behavior going on. And so we wanted to be clear that that's not allowed and then kind of give a little bit of some examples of, of what that might and what that might be. 
From a service engagement, um, this is obviously a new role. Um, this is something where um, I would describe that the impression of the campsite is changing from something that wasn't necessarily a right, but we had to have it because before the Supreme Court decision. After the Supreme Court decision, I think the philosophy of the camp has has evolved into more that it's that it's a privilege. And so if you want the privilege of being at the campsite, um, not only can you follow the rules that I've already gone over, we think you should be able to engage with services um, and, and trying to make an effort to, to work on, on different things to, to better your situation. Continual refusal to engage um, could result in trespass. The time limit, um, you heard a, a few things on that. Um, that is another thing that is, is new is, is the Homeless Coalition felt that from the public input that this concept of, of enabling and, and um, people just, this is just becoming the place they're going to be and there's no motivation to do something and, and those types of things. And that this is supposed to be a landing spot to then engage and, and move in. Um, you heard information on if you think six months is enough or not. I can't really speak to that. Um, what the Homeless Coalition landed on um, was they're limited to six months. At six months, if a camper's efforts to actively engage and transition out, they're going to be evaluated. And if they are actively engaged, if they are taking steps, um, then that stay can be extended up to, to another six months. So that would be a total of one year. Um, but that it, the language in here right now is stays will not be allowed to extend beyond one year. And, to, and then the co coalition felt that this language is after leaving St. Benedict, a camper cannot return until six months have passed. And I believe some of this was a little bit, um, not necessarily six months, but this concept of if you leave and, and you, you timing out and how soon you can come back was a little bit after how the shelter is run um, type of situation. So not the six month, that's, that's, a, that's a specific time for this. Um, but this concept of someone does need to time out and can they come right back and, and that kind of stuff. Um, trespass, if someone is trespassed, they cannot return to St. Benedict unless they've received written permission from the chief of police. Um, and then just general viol violations, you know, if they're um, all violators are subject to citation requiring court appearance and or removal from St. Benedict um, through the trespass process for violation of any rule, regulation, city ordinance or state statutes. Um, so with that, let me take a quick look at my notes from the public questions. I think I addressed as I walked through those um, items that were mentioned during the public comment. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sanchez. <laughs> Councilor Jan Vigil. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome. I uh, just want to acknowledge the work that was put into this. I think it was a month ago that we had that meeting and we got crushed about what was happening out there and we communicated this back to that group and they got to work. So thank you for putting these together. Um, I just have a few questions and a couple of like uh, likes, I really, really like that service engagement number 12, where uh, campers must actively engage with service providers. To me, that's that shows a, a, a commitment to trying to get out of there and improve their situation, whether it's through mental health or getting a job or uh, finding a, a more permanent home. Uh, the bullying piece, that was a, a deal that we got from out there. How are we going to measure that? Who's going to measure the bullying? And is there a way for people out there who are getting bullied to communicate that to somebody? And I probably should have mentioned this. Um, the, the commission or the coalition, there's two things that, that I forgot to mention. The first one is since this is a new set of rules, whatever council adopts, we need to be very intentional and deliberate with how we roll these rules out, especially meeting with the, the residents who are out there now so they're not caught by surprise. They understand this is changing and, and what enforcement is going to look like. And as part of that, 
um, we can help answer, you know, some of this. And so part of it is if they suspect illegal activity, if they feel there's bullying going on, where are safe places they can report that? And so they can obviously report it to any service provider. Um, they can report it to La Puente Outreach. Um, most importantly, they can report it to our CSOs who are out there at least once a day type of situation. And so we'll try to make sure individuals know how they can report these things, any of these rules, not just the bullying type of thing. Your question as far as how it's going to be measured, um, we tried to give examples as, you know, things that might actually happen or probably what have happened. So someone trying to force someone to change a campsite or not allowing someone to use a portage on it, but it's such a case by case situation that if, if they're reporting some of this, probably what's going to happen is a conversation and that the behavior needs to stop. And then if the behavior continues and, and it's, it's not getting better, then it could lead to trespass, but it's, it's, hard to put into words like what type of bullying is suddenly going to require a trespass. Did I answer your question? Yeah, you did. Okay. You did. Um, my next comment was on the, the number three, camp cleanliness, cleaning up the camp. Uh, I agree with Ruthie. I think she mentioned this a few hours ago about the, uh, within that three month time frame, if you can't clean up your area, or help clean up part of the camp, you shouldn't be allowed to be there. And so then you said, well, what if they're working or if they're with a service engagement? I get that. I respect that. Can we come up with a process where they can document themselves cleaning cleaning up? I, I think anything's possible. It's just a matter of workload. So with this, it was, this is a very specific time when the cleanup happens um, once a month. And if it happens to conflict for someone um, type of situation. So if we want to allow them to get credit for cleaning up at different times, then we're going to have to have like a CSO person out there to see it probably or or things like that. So I would tell you anything's possible. We just have to, we would have to think through it and there could be some, some impacts from a workload perspective. Okay. My next thing is the, the, when you talk about criminal, criminal activity, um, it, it, it specifically talks about illegal drugs. And I know this kind of paints with a broad, but broad brush, other illegal things, but we also heard of prostitution out there, or maybe uh, somebody, for lack of a better term, I don't know how to say this, but pimping somebody out. Can that maybe be specifically put in there as well? I can look at adding some language related to prostitution. Okay. And my last thing is on the time limit. These folks uh, talked about the time limit. The way I read the time limit is someone is there for six months and if there's progress with that person, if they're doing what they're supposed to do out there, helping clean up, engaging with the service, um, the service folks, the service engagement, that they are, they are allowed another six months. So I I read that as six months and you're out. I don't I don't see it that way. So you are correct that if, if they're there for six months. And then if they are actively engaged, making progress and all of that, that can be extended another six months. So it'd be a total of one year. Yeah. Okay. Those are my comments. Thank you, Councillor Yanvio, Councillor uh, Krebs, and then Councillor uh, Dominguez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, one quick question about the time limit. Um, it does say after the first six months, the camper's efforts will be evaluated. Who will do that evaluation? The CSOs. Okay. And they will talk to La Puente Outreach. They'll talk to other service providers. Um, but it will be CSOs making the determination. Okay. Thank you. Um, and that was my only question. Um, and my general comment is what I'm very, I'm very pleased with this. I really am because the alternative at the end of the day is closing the entire camp. And I did not want that to happen. I wanted to give the people that were there a chance to be successful. 
And I feel by putting rules in place, when before we couldn't put any rules in place and everyone saw how that turned out, now we have the ability to keep it open and be part of the process of getting them the help that they need. And so I, I fully support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Dominguez, and then Councillor Jackie Beal. Um, I just want to comment that I sat in on these meetings and they were very long. And there was <laughs> all the questions you asked. There are processes that they're talking about, the cleanup, sign up sheets. Um, and I think all the organizations work together um, on some hard topics and conversations, but the end goal was to get the population, I think, moving and and to help them, not just to get them out of there, but to actually help them. So I was very impressed with the way they worked together. It was hard for me not to engage, but I felt like I needed to just sit and observe because I am representative of that coalition, but they did an awesome job. Thank you, Councillor Dominguez, Councillor Jackie Vio. I was also a part of the meeting or to come up with the rules. And I think um, everybody was very engaged and they looked at all the issues. They looked at um, things that needed to be in place in order for St. Benedict's to stay open. I mean, I think we wanted to give the residents there a sense of pride you know, by saying, um, you have to follow these rules. This is your area, keep it clean. Um, and I, in my mind, it's, it's still like a privilege to live there. So, you know, be, um, coming up with these rules will give that sense of, I don't know, a sense of ownership, not ownership, but a sense of pride for each one of those people there. I believe. Thank you, Councilor Jackie Hill, Councilor Hensley. Well, I agree with what everybody has said. I think a lot of hard work went into this. And so if there's no other comments, I'm gonna go ahead and move that we go ahead and adopt the proposed rules for St. Benedict. And I'm assuming everyone's okay with the added language clarifying prostitution. My only additional comment is just the acknowledgement that the rules seem very specific, but we heard a lot of input from a, from the community and the people that lived out there. So these were necessary rules um, for it, and I second the motion. Okay, we have a motion, a second. Any further discussion? I would just like to thank the uh, coalition for the um, time and commitment you all put into this. It means a lot. Thank you. Missing one. There you go. Thank you. The motion carried unanimously. Thank you. That brings us to the next item on the agenda. Second reading and public hearing for ordinance number 26, 2024, an ordinance establishing a temporary moratorium on the establishment of medical and retail marijuana stores through June 30, 2025. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we discussed this to some degree on first reading. It's simply a moratorium until June 30th uh, in the event that the voters vote to allow medical and retail marijuana stores within the city. Staff would like uh, time to develop appropriate regulations for such stores, including zoning and means of operation and licensing and things like that. So uh, I think it's a pretty straightforward issue to put a moratorium in place. This is similar to the moratorium that we had in place in 2017. I think it was when this issue last went uh, in front of voters. It does make some provision as well for uh, dealing with applications for such outlets coming in during the course of the moratorium. Okay. Thank you. So at this time, we'll go ahead and open up the public hearing for ordinance number 26-2024, an ordinance establishing a temporary moratorium 
on the establishment of medical and retail marijuana stores through June 30th, 2025. If we have anyone in the audience who would like to make any comments uh, regarding this audit, I mean, this uh, public hearing, please come up to the podium. Um, David Burrells again. As you know uh, from the past, I I am very much, uh, I, I represent a group of people who's very much against the sale of medical marijuana in Alamosa. You know, we are the custodians of over 6,000 students that come into our city. And I just don't like the idea of having medical marijuana sold within the city. I see plenty of people who are high and they say they take medical marijuana. Uh, it's just, it opens up a lot of worms. There's a lot of complications. There's law enforcement. You'll have to add to the law enforcement. And it just brings to the city a lot of complications. And I just had a friend back in June who lives in, in Fort Collins give me a call and say, should I send my daughter to university here? Is it a, basically he said, is it a drug-free city? I said, yes, I'm very proud of the city. I'd like to keep the city that way. So the longer we can put this moratorium, <laughs> let's extend it for one year instead of just six months. Uh, I'm in favor of that. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Do we have anyone else in the audience who would like to make any comments regarding this public hearing? If so, please come up to the podium. And if not, we'll be going up to the Zoom participants next. Okay, I don't see anyone coming to the podium. So we'll now go to the Zoom participants. If you're on Zoom and you would like to make any comments in regards to this ordinance, please click on the raise your hand feature so you can be recognized. Uh, to make your comments. Okay, I don't see any hands raised. Um, Ariel, okay, so we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. I turn it over to Council. Council Yonder Hill. Mayor, I move that we approve on second reading ordinance number 26 2024. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, please start voting. The motion carried unanimously. Hey, thank you. All right. We're getting down to the last one. We're, we're approaching that four hours that y'all mentioned about those other meetings. No. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. That brings us to the second reading and public hearing for ordinance number 25-2024 and ordinance amending the establishment, I mean, established pay plan for city officers and employees in accordance to Article 3, Section 11 of the Charter and as referred to in Section 15-2 of the Code of Ordinances concerning personal nail rules and regulations and pay plan for city officers and employees. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this ordinance does essentially um, two things. The, the first one is based on the city's compensation policy. Um, we try to tie our cost of living adjustment to the five-year average of the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. Um, we can't always afford that, um, but this year the budget does allow for us to tie it to what that five-year average is, which is 4.2%. So what this would do is shift our entire pay plan and those positions that are in the pay plan up by 4.2%. The second item that this ordinance does is that we need to be compliant with the state minimum wage, and it is increasing by 2.7%. That only impacts um, some positions that actually aren't in our pay plan. So this also shifts up some of those um, positions by the 2.7% to meet the state minimum wage. Now there was some housekeeping done on the ordinance between first reading and what you see tonight. The ordinance had referred also to the um, pay for performance of 4% and some of the additional FTEs, but those are actually covered in your budget ordinance. Um, and so when you passed the, the 2025 budget, that included the FTEs and that four, up to 4% pay for performance. So we took that language out of this one. So um, this ordinance does those two things, the 4.2% COLA and the compliance with the state minimum wage with the 2.7%. 
Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. So at this time, I'll open up the public hearing for ordinance number 25-2024. Do we have anyone in the audience who would like to make any comments regarding this ordinance? I don't see anyone going to the podium. So I'll go ahead and go to the Zoom participants. If you would like to make comments regarding this ordinance, please raise your hand by clicking on the raise your hand feature. Okay, so I don't see any hands raised, so we'll go ahead and close the public hearing, bring it back to council. Councilor Jan Vigil. Mayor, I move that we approve on second reading ordinance number 25 2024. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, please start voting. The motion carried unanimously. Thank you. That brings us to um, committee reports. Do we have any committee reports? Councilor um, Dominguez. This one's short. It was, wasn't as heavy meeting as they usually have, but maintenance for the housing authority, the maintenance, they're gearing up for winter on some equipment, um, purchasing some new equipment, assessing what they have in their budget to get some other smaller equipment to make the job easier. Um, I did note that they were also tending to letters from removing trees too. So it's just not the public. Everybody has to remove trees for the sweeper and they're um, attending to that. And um, just working through some of the eviction stuff and, and how important that is to stay in the line with the law and the, and what's going on. So they really do a good job with that. And that was it. Thank you, Councilor Dominguez. No further uh, committee reports, staff announcements. We do not have any staff announcements. Oh, oh wow. All righty. Council comments. Oh, Council Krebs. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to thank staff. Um, this was a heavy, heavy meeting, and we covered a lot of really um, difficult topics tonight. So I just want to thank staff for all the hard work they put in to, to giving us the information to help make decisions tonight. Thank you. Okay. Any other lights before I wrap things up? I just want to send a shout out to Beata. She was at the uh, housing conference last week in um, Keystone, and it was good to see her and uh, see her representing our city extremely well. And I saw her in between one of the breakout sessions, and she mentioned to me, she says, you know, I'm learning a lot, but the good news is we're already doing a lot of these things. So I want to say uh, congratulations to our team. She really represented as well. Okay, everyone, good job. This meeting is officially adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>